Um, I'm pleased to have you all here um, and that we have Bonnie Anderson here on behalf of Brooklyn Public Library to talk about the life and legacy of Ernestine Rose. Uh, Ms. An Professor Anderson spent 30 years teaching at Brooklyn College and the Graduate Center of City University of New York as a professor of history and women's studies. She has four books out, the latest of which is The Rabbi's Atheist Daughter. And I am very excited to hear more about the details of this oft overlooked figure, Ernestine Rose's life. Thank you very much. Um, I'm delighted to talk about Ernestine Rose. Shouldn't I be in the screen or? You are. Oh, okay. I'm not used to seeing the audience when I speak on Zoom. Um, anyway, I'm delighted to talk about Ernestine Rose because most people don't know who she was. And let me begin by saying that in the middle of the 19th century, she was more famous than either Susan B. Anthony or Elizabeth Cady Stanton. And she's been quite forgotten today. So I first want to talk about her life and then I will talk about how she has been forgotten and then I'll take questions. So she was born in Poland in 1810, the only daughter of a rabbi and his wife we don't know their first names because so many papers in Polish history have been lost, including the Jewish records from the town she was born in, Piotrkow Trybunalski. And when I was in Poland, I would sometimes call it Piotrkow and people would always correct me and say, no, it's Piotrkow Trybunalski because it was the site of the main tribunal in Poland, uh, the Polish Supreme Court in the 17th and 18th centuries. And I think that was important in her life. So she's born in 1810. We don't know what her Hebrew names were. Those have been lost. Um, and she's the only child of Rabbi Potowski. And when she's five years old, he sends her to a Hader, which was a, a Jewish school to learn Yiddish and how to read and write. And she's punished for something she didn't know was against the rules. And she feels that's extremely unfair. And she goes to her father and says, this was unjust and I want to study at home with you. And he agrees. Now this was very unusual, but men who did not have sons often made a daughter into what was called a surrogate son. And so he teaches her Hebrew, which normally women would, women would not have been taught and they read Torah together. And Ernestine, which I have to call her because I have no idea what her Hebrew name was. You know, I wondered if it was Esther or something beginning with an E, but I just don't know, began to ask questions. And her father said, little girls should not ask questions. And she knew that little boys were supposed to ask questions. And she said that that was her beginning in the field of what in those years was called women's rights or what we would call feminism. Because if little boys could ask questions, why couldn't little girls ask questions? She goes on and when she's 12 years old, she begins to doubt God's authority. And she uses a saying, and whenever I speak to older Jewish groups, I ask them if anyone has ever heard of this saying, and no one has in her town, it was, you shall keep the Sabbath unto the breaking of a piece of straw. So she goes into the dining room and she holds a piece of straw and it's a Saturday, the Sabbath. And she says, God, I don't want to offend you. So if you don't want me to break this piece of straw, send me a sign. Nothing happens. She breaks the straw. And she says that that's when she ended with Judaism forever. However, she goes through the motions and she keeps going to synagogue. And actually, and this is quite strange, the building, the synagogue building still exists in Pyotrkov Tribunalski. It's now the central public library. And when I walked into it, there was a big bulletin board and it was filled with things about Ernestine Rose. So I was very pleased about that. But when she's 15, her mother dies and leaves her a fair amount of money. And her father, and this was totally the custom throughout much of the 19th century, betrothes her to a man whom she it wasn't always the case, a man she does not want to marry. And uh, her father 
won't release her. And she throws herself weeping at the feet of her fiance, begging him to release her from the engagement. And he says, you're beautiful and you're rich. Why should I release you? And a few uh, days later, he goes to the local Polish court, which was not in Piotrkow Trybunalski, but in a town called Kalish, about 60 miles away, to plead for his right to the dowry. And this is where she really takes action. And, you know, she's just turned 16. It's January in Poland. And she hires a sleigh and rides through the woods to Kalish. The sleigh breaks down in the middle of the night. And she says to the sleigh driver, he wants to wait. And she says, you can't wait. My case is being heard tomorrow. Go and get help. And she sits in the sleigh hearing howls of wolf packs. And he does come back, fixes the sleigh. And the next morning she goes to court and pleads her own case and she wins. The Polish, the, the, I looked at the, the records. I couldn't find anything to do with her, but lots of women did plead their own cases. People rarely used lawyers in those days. And she won, she goes back home and she finds that her father has married, remarried a young woman her own age. And she says she could not get on with her stepmother. And so she gives her father an appreciable amount of the money and leaves her family, her town and Poland forever. And of course, Judaism. She goes not to Warsaw, the capital of Poland, but to Berlin. Warsaw was a very religious city and it was the center of the Hasid, the Hasidim uh, sect, you know, who were extremely spiritual and religious, sort of the opposite of her. And she goes instead to Berlin. And Berlin in these years had the beginnings of what was going to be called Reform Judaism. It also was a center of a great deal of reading. There were lots of libraries and subscription things and you could, you could find what she called modern books, new books very easily. By old books, she meant the Bible, which is what most people just read over and over again in their life. And she starts to read new books and it's in Berlin that she encounters the ideals that are going to guide her life. And those are the principles of the enlightenment. The Enlightenment prized reason and questioned things that had been traditional for centuries. Why should there be divine right of kings? Why should there be a state church? Why should Jews be, as they called it, unemancipated, you know, not to have any civil rights? And these principles, as I say, remained with her for the rest of her life. She stays in Berlin for two years, and then she goes on to Paris. Now, traveling then was not easy. There weren't railroads in those years in Europe. And uh, so she has to travel by stagecoach. And since she didn't own one, she's traveling by the postal coaches, which were known as bone knockers and were extremely stuffy and uncomfortable. But she gets to Paris just before the revolution of 1830. Now that's a revolution that's not very well known. Uh, we know of the French Revolution of 1789. But in 1830, the then king, a restored Bur Bourbon monarch, was trying to uh, bring back divine right of kings. And of course, there still was this Catholic church. He wants to make any uh, sacrilege a capital offense. So Ernestine is there during what were called les trois glorieuses, the three glorious days of the revolution of 1830. And she sees the culmination of that revolution, which is Lafayette, our Lafayette, who's 72 at the time, bring a, a cousin who was much more liberal, Louis Philippe, to be the new king of France. And I went to the exact same place in front of the Tuileries Palace and saw the balcony where she, where she had watched, you know, where she had seen this happen. So uh, Louis Philippe becomes king. Rose never liked the idea of monarchy. She said that from the time she had first heard of the United States of America, she wanted to live in a republic, that is a government that is not monarchical. And she leaves Paris and goes further west to the largest city in Europe, London. 
and she arrives there late in 1830. It's very easy to get into Britain in those years because there aren't passports yet. So she just enters, she becomes one of a flood of immigrants that were going to London. About a third of the population of London in those years had not been born there. And in London, she meets a man who will be uh, in a way her second father, uh, a man who's tremendously important in her life, Robert Owen. Now most people haven't heard of Robert Owen today, but he was world famous at the time. He had begun life in the lower middle class. By 20, he was running a textile factory. And by 30, he was uh, running one of the largest factories in the British Isles in a town in New Lanark called New Lanark in Scotland. And when Rose meets him, he is 62 and uh, very famous. And he has become, oddly enough for a factory owner, a socialist. He has decided that the evils in the world are property, religion, and what he called uh, fake marriage. So he issues a declaration of mental independence in 1825, proclaiming these three goals. And people who heard him speak said he was such a nice, kind, and gentle man that they could hear these goals where they wouldn't have listened to a more, you know, fiery or radical person. And Rose makes him her second father. She, she writes him, my dear father, he calls her his daughter, and he replaces her real father who had principles she couldn't agree with, with his principles, which are uh, basically uh, that everybody should have equal rights. And by everybody, he meant men, women, whites, blacks, everyone. And that uh, kindness should rule the world. And he believes that he created this in his factory town. And he really did. Uh, anyone who visited was incredibly impressed. At the time, workers were tremendously exploited. They often had to work seven days a week, at least six days a week, 12 to 14 hours. Children started working at five and they were treated abominably. And Owen decided that he would get more money and make a better factory if he treated his workers well. And it worked. So people would come and visit and just be so impressed with how, how fortunate everybody was. He almost invented early childhood education. You know, he took children from age one, he decided they should be allowed to dance and have gymnastics, and he would bring uh, produce into the classroom or different objects for them to study. And uh, he really was quite a, quite a person. It's in Owenism that uh, Ernestine finds a social life. Uh, every Sunday, instead of going to church, the Owenites would hold gatherings and they would have tea, they would talk, they would have dances, they would have music, and they would have speeches. And it's in these circles that Potowska, as she was then called, first becomes a public speaker. She's, you know, not very old. She's uh, in her late teens. And people who heard her speak said she was beautiful, she was eloquent, she had quite an accent. Her English is not perfect, but she's very eloquent. And she begins to speak, she loves to dance, and it's in these circles that she meets her adoring and beloved future husband, William Rose. Now, at one point in work, doing this work, I was going to write an essay called Negative Research because there was so much I couldn't find out. And one of the things was William Rose. I, my original field was English history and I knew that the British had started a census in 1801. So I thought, okay, I'll look him up. What I did not know until I did this book was that they didn't do anything except count people until 1841. So yes, he was born in 1813 and that's all we know. We don't know where, we don't know his parents' name, we don't know how he became a silversmith, which is what he made his living at. But they fall madly in love and they decide they want to marry. Now marriage in England, one reason Owen was so against traditional marriage was in England, uh, if you were not a Jew, you had to be married in the Church of England to have the marriage be official. <laughs> 
And of course, Ernestine and William don't want to do that. So they hire a notary public to come to her apartment and he testifies that they are now married. And they decide uh, to go with a, an Owenite group to America. In these years, a lot of people decided to form communes like Owen had created in New Lanark in the British Isles and also in Eastern America. So they get on a sailing ship. There were very few steamships in those years. It takes three weeks to cross the Atlantic. And on the trip, Ernestine says she realized that the people there were not prepared to form a commune. So Ernestine and William leave in New York City and they will remain there from 1836 until 1869. Now, it's in New York that she begins her political activity. There was a fairly large circle of Owenites, so she begins to meet with them. But early on, she has a petition drawn up for married women's property rights. Now, this might seem an odd cause for a socialist, but uh, you know she didn't know William all that well. She still had some money left from her mother's inheritance. And the legal doctrine in those years following British law was that man and wife are one person and that person is the man. So anything a woman owned, whether it was property or a salary belonged to the husband. And there were many real life cases of a separated couple and the husband goes to the wife's workplace on Friday and gets her paycheck. So she goes you know, through lower Manhattan trying to get signatures. She said she got six in six months, but she doesn't give up and she keeps on doing that activity. And that's her first political activity. Now in the early 1840s, she drops out and doesn't do anything political. And that's because it's during those years that she bears two children. Unfortunately, both of them died as babies. And she talks about this very, uh, objectively and says that there's a reason why women should go to medical school so we can know how to take care of our children and that it's you know just such a crime that we don't have the medical knowledge to be able to care for our children correctly. When that is over she goes back to her political work and she starts doing married women's property rights again. And it becomes a whole cause in New York state, which is one of the first states in the United States to give women married women property rights. It's during those years that she will encounter the three causes that dominate her, her career. First is free thought. Now free thought was people who did not believe in, in a religion in being religious. So we would call them, I guess, atheists or agnostics. In their own day, they were generally called infidels. That was the pejorative term. Free thinkers is the complementary term, but they're usually called infidels. And it was much worse for a woman to be an infidel than a man because it carried the sexual connotation of being unfaithful to your husband. And Rose is accused of that many times, although she, she never was. Her second big cause is one that I'm sure you've all heard of, and that's anti-slavery. She thinks that everybody should be free, black, white, male, female, and she becomes an abolitionist. And she speaks for abolition, which again was a very unpopular cause, even in the North. A lot of uh, white Americans thought uh, blacks should go back to Africa. That was the place they belonged in. You know, if you were gonna end slavery, that was the way to do it. Her third cause, which she gets into in the late 1840s, is of course women's rights. And that's what feminism was called then. And she, uh, you know, has always believed in women's rights from the time she was, you know, a little girl. Uh, the, uh, the, the Seneca Falls uh, meeting, which I'm sure you've heard of in 1848, was very small. It was 300 people in upstate New York. It was called after you know, a week of quite minor publicity. And the next one is held in 1850 in Worcester, Massachusetts. Now Worcester was a real city, a growing city, and it attracts a thousand people. And one of the people who goes is Ernestine Rose. 
and she makes speeches, she's put on committees, she becomes a member of the growing women's rights movement. It's in the next year, 1851, that she makes a speech that a historian of the movement who wrote in 1870 called her unsurpassed speech. A speech arguing for women's rights using all the techniques she had at her disposal, which include humor, sarcasm, as well as her basic eloquence. Uh, she says, uh, people say that a man keeps his wife. Well, so does he keep his horse. You know, shouldn't a wife have something better? She said, why should a wife lose all her rights once she gets married and presumably is gonna become a mother? That's exactly when she needs her rights. She says, people say men are stronger than women. Well, animals are stronger than men. We don't base the right to vote on how strong you are. And it really is an amazing speech and it launches her as one of the centers of the early American women's movement, which again, most people haven't heard about. Most people know that women got the vote in this country in the eight, in 1920s and hear about the early 20th century movement but that movement was much less radical and open than the earlier movement. The earlier movement included black women. She shares a stage with Sojourner Truth, with Mary Ellen Watkins Harper, um, a number of black women. She becomes friends with Frederick Douglass. And after she and William die, he pays tribute to them and says, they treated me just like a brother. I never felt unequal in their company and they were wonderful human beings. And uh, she's going to be incredibly active during the 1850s. The women's rights movement gives a convention every year except 1857. And in 1856, she's the president of the convention which meets in Philadelphia. People objected to an atheist being president but she doesn't, you know, she, she really muted her religious beliefs in the women's rights conventions which I didn't realize until I read the proceedings were amazingly religious and Christian, of course. They sing hymns, they have prayers, they keep invoking Jesus, you know, that Jesus would have been for women's rights. Uh, they talk about the first version in Genesis, you know, male and female created he them, and they downplay the Adam and Eve story. And she never, never talks about her religious beliefs in these conventions. Instead, she uses all her, you know, very powerful arguments for women's rights and sometimes for anti-slavery as well, because that was very acceptable to these women, many of whom had began, begun as abolitionists and realized when they were fighting for the rights of the slave that they didn't have rights either. You know, that's what converted them to be women's rights women. So when I say amazingly active, I, I detailed one year of her life, 1855, where she travels every single month outside of New York. Now, New York did have railroads at that point. They, they go 20 miles an hour, so it's a long trip. And she goes as far west as Michigan, uh, all the way up to Maine and south to Virginia. So she really travels a great deal. Um, People have heard of her reputation and a newspaper in Maine says, an atheist is worse than a prostitute. We don't want an atheist talking in this town, which was Portland, the capital of Maine. And she's very well received contrary to this newspaper. Uh, unfortunately, well, unfortunately, of course, for everybody, the civil war is beginning to loom. And among many other things, the Civil War will bring an end to the early women's movement because it's such an important and fracturing cause. Not that Southern women were women's rights women, they're not, but it, it's going to supersede uh, the attention of Northern women as well. So they suspend their women's rights conferences from 1860 to 1865. And Rose uh, has a difficult time in these years. First of all, she's what is called a disunionist. She doesn't believe that the United States should remain a union. She said, I don't wanna be in the same country as South Carolina. 
she had gone to South Carolina as a young woman and she'd been treated terribly. Someone had said, if you were not a woman, you would be tarred and feathered. And she said, I'm always proud to be a woman and I don't think you have the energy to tar and feather me since slaves do all the work around here. You know, she, and they smuggle her out of Charleston. Um, but she, so she's a disunionist. She's also extremely critical of Lincoln. She believes that Lincoln should have freed all the slaves as soon as the war begins. Now, Lincoln could not. He was very narrowly elected. He wants to keep the mid-Atlantic states, which are often slave states in the Union, but she condemns him whenever she speaks and she gets hissed. And she says, that's proof that I said the only correct thing. Now, her major fault is in that kind of uh, remark. She was very self-righteous. She's righteous and righteousness often melds into self-righteousness. And she, she assumes that she is always correct and she corrects other people a little too much. During the 1860s, she also suffered a, a terrible blow, which is anti-Semitism, but not from the source you might think. For years, she had written and been published in, uh, written for and been published by the atheist newspaper in America, which had a closeted name. It was called the Boston Investigator. And it comes out on a weekly basis and it's tiny print and you know many columns, lots of articles. And they always write about Ernestine Rose. And the editor was a man named Horace Seaver. And Seaver and Rose were very good friends. Uh, she contributed to a fund to raise money for him. And he printed a poem that's uh, what's called an acrostic poem. The front, the first letter of each line spells out her name, Ernestine L. Rose. But in 1864, he publishes an anti-Semitic diatribe. Now, atheists in these years were very much against the ancient Hebrews. They felt that they were really terrible people because they'd invented religion and religion was bad and so they were bad. But they didn't criticize modern Jews. But in, these, in his letter, Seaver criticizes modern Jews for carrying out the principles of Judaism and says they should be forced to leave the country. And Rose is terribly upset by this. And one of her heroes was Thomas Paine. Now, this is not Thomas Paine who wrote Common Sense. It's Thomas Paine who wrote the book, The Age of Reason, in which he criticized Christianity, Judaism, and Islam all for being religions. And Rose and others had organized celebrations of his birthday, which are on January 29th. And they'd have dinners and dancing and you know make speeches. And Rose sends her reply to Seaver on January 29th of 1864, and it's a significant date. And she says, I thought I smelled brimstone, Mr. Editor, genuine Christian brimstone in your letter saying that the modern Jews should be forced to leave the United States. How can you possibly believe such a thing? You know, Jews are like other people in societies that treat them justly. They rise to prominence in every position. And, you know, in societies that are oppressed, them, they become more rigid. And she uses France as an example. Now, Seaver does not play fair. He's the editor. He divides her letters, which aren't very long, into two parts and rebuts each half separately. And, uh, some, you know, some readers, most readers sided with Seaver and the, the verb used about what Rose is doing is that she's scolding. Now, if she'd been a man, no one would have used that verb, but as she's a woman, she's scolding. And she said, yes, I'm scolding in a good way, you know. She writes four letters and then they both stop. And she doesn't write for the uh, Boston investigator for five years which was a tremendous break for her. Now it's a terrible blow to the historian because that was the major source of her writings and speeches. But in the late 1860s, there's another factor in her life. She's getting sick. I have a good friend who's a doctor and he actually traveled to Poland with me and I asked him to diagnose her. 
And he said, I can't do it. She's so vague about her system uh, s symptoms. I have no idea what she suffered from. Maybe fibromyalgia, you know, she says she's dizzy. She, it hurts when she sits up, uh, she's too weak. You know, it's, it's impossible to say, but she definitely is getting sicker and sicker. Now in those years before modern medicine, there were two uh, things that sick people should do. Women were supposed to rest and Lord knows they needed it. And men were supposed to travel. Mm -hmm. And Rose and her husband decide to return to England in 1869. We have no idea why, she never explained why. Three weeks before they leave, she takes out US citizenship in her own right. Now she had US citizenship because her husband was a US citizen and women assumed the citizenship of their, their husbands. Uh, and uh, Susan B. Anthony and others, uh, you know, gather presents for her. They give her a luncheon at a club called Cirrhosis and give her a bag of a, a basket of roses for Mrs. Rose from cirrhosis and also a, a substantial check because they've raised funds for her. And she and William go back to England and they spend uh, the first year and a half when they have quite a bit of money uh, touring spas, taking the waters and she gets better. Uh, they then lose a lot of their property. They had property in Chicago and it's burned in the Chicago fire. And there's another fire, which I'd never heard of in Boston. And a lot of their property is burned in that fire. So they're not as wealthy as they were, but they settle in London. And in London, they find a new community of free thinkers. And they were a very gregarious and popular couple and they make friends with this community. Her best friend was a man named Charles Bradlaugh, who was one of the heads of the British Atheist Society. And he's famous for having been elected to parliament in the House of Commons and not being allowed to take his seat because he would not swear an oath to God. And this goes on for seven years. And he makes speeches standing at the bar in front of the House of Commons, not entering. And uh, an, an American newspaper reporter uh, interviews him and says, how are you able to carry on? He said, I had so much support and support always moves me. And I nearly cried when I went in the lobby and Mrs. Ernestine Rose kissed me. She also becomes very good friends with his two daughters, Alice and Hypatia. Hypatia was a Greek woman who had been stoned to death by Christians for not being religious. And both women become very close friends of hers. So she's living in London and she begins speaking again because she's recovered her health. So she speaks in Scotland, she speaks at various meetings in London. She encourages British women who were not used to speaking in public at all to do so. There is a, uh, a law passed that if women own property, they can run for certain offices like mayor. And she encourages them to do so and you know, kind of uh, coaches them how to, how to run for office. Now it's unfortunately in England that the great tragedy of her life occurs. In 1882, William dies on the street of a heart attack and she's heartbroken. And um, friends gather around her. There's a bit, very large funeral service for him, uh, you know, to pay tribute really to Ernestine. And um, she's, she's heartbroken. Uh, Susan B. Anthony visits her a few years later and says, if only she believed in heaven that she would meet William again, but she doesn't. And uh, she, she carries on, she speaks in public again a few times. But by the mid um, 1870s, she is, is not, no longer well enough to speak. Her last speech is actually in Paris at a peace conference and she speaks in French. So she remains incredibly talented until the end. Um, she, as she's beginning to age and she lives to be 82, which was a good age for that period. 
she's worried that people will try to convert her on her deathbed. Now, this was a fairly common practice. Christians believed that atheists would, atheists would convert at the last minute so they wouldn't die an atheist. And so she arranges for Hypatia to be at her bedside when she's dying to prevent anyone from doing this. And people really did this kind of thing. And she sends, uh, she sends a, a, a speech she made. She, wrote, she made a speech into a book. It's called A Defense of Atheism. And it argues that atheists are not only scientific, they're better than religious people because they don't believe you get a reward for being a good person. It's, it's just you know good to be good. Um, and when she's dying, Hypatia doesn't make it in time, but her doctor defends her from anybody coming to her deathbed. Her memorial in 1892 is attended by a great many people, including Mahatma Gandhi, who's in London at that time, and a man named Edward, uh, then George Holyoke, you know, speaks in her, uh, of her life. And uh, there, you know, the tributes are reprinted in the American newspapers, and she's very well known at, at her death in 1892. But by the 1920s, she's almost completely forgotten. A Jewish newspaper writes, not one American in a thousand has heard of Ernestine Rose in the late 1920s. So why was she so forgotten? I think it's because she's such an outlier. You know, she was a foreigner. Americans always call her a foreigner. She calls herself a foreigner, even though she lived in this country for well over 30 years. Secondly, she's an atheist. And that, of course, is unacceptable to many people. Um, not so much anymore, but certainly in those years. Uh, there was a Gallup poll done in the 1950s and only, I think it's, I forget the exact figure, but under 30% of Americans would vote for an atheist for president. By 2012, 54% would vote for an atheist for president, but many more would vote for a woman, a gay person, a black, than would vote for an atheist. And finally, she's a woman. And there's a reason women's history is invented in the 1970s, and it was a major effort of my life, because women had been left out of history. And I know when my writing partner and dear friend, Judith Sinzer and I were writing our first book on women's history, people would say, women's history, is there any? What are you writing? A broad view of history, ha ha, a history of diapers. And that was the kind oh. of reception we got. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Those were the real words. Um, and, I think all those factors, being a foreigner, an atheist, an outlier, and a woman, are the reason she was forgotten. Now, there was an article in the Boston Investigator in the 1870s that said, Rose will be honored in 100 years. And that's pretty much when it happened. Uh, you know, book, books began to be published. And uh, when I encountered her, I thought I have to write about this wonderful woman. People should know about her life. So that's it for me. We have time for questions. Ask anything you want. I have a question, may I go? Of course, Ira. I am curious um, if you see any parallels between her and Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And if so, what are they? Well, I think one major parallel, there's someone who wants to be admitted and she's actually a niece of mine. Okay. <laughs> um, neither of them were allowed to work in the profession they wanted to be. Hi, Sarah. Um, you know, when Bader Ginsburg uh, graduates from law school, she can't get a job as an attorney. So she becomes a volunteer for the ACLU and those are her first cases, but she's not being paid for it. And Rose said that she would like to be an attorney, not to plead the worst case, you know, but to make justice for women uh, her cause. So I think that's a big similarity in them. And they both, you know, dissented. They both took their own path and made their own way. 
and had courage, tremendous courage. So are there other questions? Yes, I have a question. Uh -huh. um, what you said that Owen um, was opposed to fake marriage and what exactly is fake marriage? Uh, fake marriage was the marriage that existed in England at the time he was writing. The when any, any Christian, yeah. uh, no matter you know whether they were a Quaker or a Presbyterian, had to be married in the Church of England to have the marriage be legal. Okay, and there was basically no divorce. The only way to get divorce in the, divorced in those years was to have an act of parliament separate act of parliament, which of course was extremely expensive and only available to men. So uh, one diatribe that Rose wrote was after uh, the British parliament had to deal with the subject of divorce because so many women raised the issue. And what they did was make divorce uh, easier to obtain. Uh, you didn't need a separate act of parliament. You could sue for divorce. A man could get a divorce on the ground, one ground. A woman needed two grounds, you know, and incompatibility isn't one of them. It, you know, he had to be a, a bigamist or bestiality or something horrible. So it's, and then they decided they didn't need to give married women property rights since they had allowed her to get out of a bad marriage. So Rose's diatribe is against that law. Divorce was raised in America by Elizabeth Cady Stanton in 1860. Rose had not mentioned divorce because she knew that if she did, she would be called a free lover, which is a term of opprobrium, kind of like a prostitute. Uh, and, but Stanton raises it. And Rose had always believed in divorce the way Owen did. That is, both parties should take care of whatever children there were, and the split should be equitable. That is, both should get half the property. Very modern. You know, it wasn't until a few years ago that New York State allowed no-fault divorce. When I got divorced, I had to sue my husband for abandonment, even though we both agreed <laughs> to abandon each other. Bonnie, I have a question. Uh -huh. um, what about her entrepreneurial spirit, um, inventing, you know, Oh, I didn't mention that. Yes, yes. thank you. Um, when she's in Berlin, she develops uh, a perfumed paper, a paper you could either put in a room or burn because what happened in those years without any central heating, of course, there are only fireplaces, um, people would close rooms for the entire winter and odors would result. So she invents this perfumed paper and sells it and makes money that way. And when she comes to London, she barely speaks English, but she goes around with a dictionary and her paper to various pharmacies and says that if they sell it, they'll, it would, they give her much of the money back. And that's how she makes a living in London in the beginning. She also teaches languages. She teaches Hebrew and German to an English, a wealthy English family's daughters. But and then when she's in New York City, um, she sells the perfumed paper out of William's store, her, his jewelry store. And um, the uh, Owenite newspaper uh, prints, it was called the Beacon, uh, prints a, an advertisement for her paper. And it's the only you know, advertisement in the entire newspaper in its 10 year run. So she was very well thought of in that regard. And she's never paid for speaking. Uh, others are, but she, uh, people say she never took money for her speeches. She always financed them herself. And she and William saved money by never employing a servant. They didn't think it was a good idea. And almost every middle-class family had servants, at least one servant in those years, to empty the chamber pots or do the laundry. I mean, they're very dirty and difficult tasks. So she was a good entrepreneur too. Any other questions? Feel free. I have another one, Bonnie. Okay. So how did you discover Ernestine? Um, 
Well, I discovered her doing my book before this one, which was called Joyous Greetings, the First International Women's Movement. And, you know, women's movements were always uh, looked at from one nation, you know, the American women's movement, the British women's movement, the French women's movement. And I came across uh, a letter that two French women had sent from their prison cell in Paris to their sisters in America and also to their sisters in England. And it was proclaiming women's rights as an international cause. And I was fascinated by this. And as I began to look at international connections, of course, Ernestine Rose was there because her first, uh, her first public speech in 1850, she's given their letter to read out loud. And she reads it and then talks about it and talks, and she always pushed internationalism. She said, our cause is not for old England, or it's not for new England or old England, but for the world. And she's always an internationalist. And I think that's Probably another reason she may have been forgotten, but it also is one of her great attributes. Anyone else? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I have one more, it's funny. Okay, but, okay. <laughs> and this goes back to um, Ira's question about Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Um, so do you think that Ruth Bader Ginsburg had um, knew about Ernestine or ever read her? Um, because there's the quote from RBG about, we don't ask anything of, our, of men, but to take their foot off our neck. Right, that's a quotation from Sarah Grimke. It's mm -hmm. not Ernestine Rose. And I have no evidence that she knew about her. Okay. You know, I wish she did, but. I don't know, okay. I have no evidence, but that is Sarah Grimke, who was a, a very boring speaker. In fact, uh, there's one convention where Lucretia Mott writes, I thought she would never stop talking. <laughs> she was so boring, it went on and on and on. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, Bonnie, for your time. And thank you everyone for attending. And I hope everyone has a wonderful evening.